up for our first uh, session today. We have uh, CNN anchor, Ms. Odell O'Brien. I'll let a round of applause for her. You can't jump through it. I realize it's cool. <laughs> I think you guys know uh, Ms. O'Brien's work, so um, I will only give you a little bit of information about what she's doing right now. I think that's really important. I would like to cover today things that are important I think you should know. A, uh, she is a uh, special correspondent and an anchor on CNN currently right now, uh, and she's producing a tremendous amount of documentaries with her, her group there. Um, second thing is she just wrote uh, a book that was released last year. November. Um, that is awesome reading you should read. And finally, she's just created a uh, significant family foundation uh, that she had a first fundraiser for that's going to give her the ability to assist uh, a lot of folks kind of in her passion, uh, assist, I think primarily young women right now who need some uh, motivation and some tools to accomplish their dreams. So today we'll cover a little bit of each one of those. Uh, and then you guys get to uh, ask some good questions so you can write some awesome blogs and some statements on Facebook and some ideas on Twitter. Uh, so getting started, how about we start with, I think people will be surprised to find out where you're from. Uh, um, I'm from Long Island, New York, which is, I think, the opposite of New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it's sort of the cultural vast wasteland for known for our shopping malls kind of thing. Um, my mother is uh, Cuban and black. My dad is Australian and white. The neighborhood I grew up in in Long Island on the North Shore was 99.96% white, which made for a fun childhood, as you can imagine. You had uh, siblings? Five brothers and sisters, three sisters, two brothers. And you are in which place? Now I'm number five. My mom had six kids in seven years. Wow. And uh, she came to America when I was my parents met in 1958. They were both at Johns Hopkins University. And of course, in 1958, interracial dating was very much frowned upon. So my mom used to tell stories about how she and my dad, when they started dating, no restaurants would serve them together. And um, people would spit on them as they would walk by together. Um, in fact, when they went and got married, interracial marriage was illegal in the country at the end of 1958 uh, in 16 states. So uh, they were in Maryland, they drove to Washington, D.C., they got married, and then drove back to Baltimore and lived illegally until the Supreme Court overturned the ban on interracial marriage, which wasn't done until my little brother, so the sixth kid, was born uh, in 1967. It was actually when it was no longer illegal for black people and white people to get married in 16 days. You lived in Long Island until what time? Uh, I lived in Long Island my entire life until I went off to college. And you went to college? I went to Harvard in uh, or class of 2008. Oh, no, class of 1988. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was so annoying, wasn't it? <laughs> I had to shave 20 years off my head. Uh, it was class of 1988. Um, but Harvard wasn't new for you at this point. You were a little, a little bit familiar with Harvard. Yeah, my, everyone in my, all my siblings had gone or have gone now to Harvard in some capacity, either the law school or the medical school or undergraduate. Um, which I think for me actually helped me a lot. It demystified uh, the process. Um, and it really made me realize that the concept of role modeling is very important and very real. Meaning that when my sister Maria, who went to Harvard in 1978, I think, um, and Harvard at that time was looking to diversify, they had never accepted women, actually. And so uh, Radcliffe had women, Harvard was accepting women. So my sister was heavily recruited to Harvard and she was a minority, heavily recruited to attend Harvard. And so when she went, it kind of made me realize, like, well, she's not brilliant. I mean, I could go, you know, but it was very doable just to see somebody that you knew well. And, you know, she was just a hard worker and a good student. And I think after grad, it made me understand the power of having people see people accomplish something that once you see it happen, it's much easier to come to the conclusion that you too can make it. And I, that's sort of, I think, part of the thing that we try to focus on in the foundation. And even in the work that I do, this idea of if you can show people examples of people who are succeeding, and also examples of, of the struggle, what they have to get through, 
I think it makes it much more attainable for others who are watching, as opposed to making it seem like it's magic somehow. Your major was? Uh, I was English and American literature and pre-medical science. So I was pre-med. Because you were going to? Medical school. I was hoping to go to medical school, and I took organic chemistry with my sister, who's now a doctor, <laughs> uh, and I'm clearly not. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think an honorary, an honorary PhD <laughs> does not count. Um, she was, we were taking organic chemistry together, and, uh, and she, uh, she's brilliant. Um, really brilliant in the sciences. Zero, like no absolute clueless when it comes to general intelligence about things. For example, she would drive down the street, my mother's Chevette one day, and there was a bee in the car with her. And as the bee was swirling around, she was so afraid of bees that she slammed the Chevette into every car on the side. <laughs> right, right, as opposed to just pulling over. So like, brilliant. No common sense at all. Uh, so she was taking organic chemistry, we took it together. She was a couple years ahead of me in school, but we took it together. And I realized that she was just very passionate about it. She really understood it. She cared about it. She cared about science. She cared to, she could, um, she used to say to me, why do you memorize? You know, organic chemistry, for anybody who slog through it, it's all memorization of molecules, you know, H2O. And uh, she said, well, you know, why do you memorize it? You should be able to deduce formulas. Y equals MX plus B. Clearly, Y equals the X, Y axis, and Z is a variable in space. I mean, obviously, what else could it be? And I was like, wow, I have no idea what you're talking about. I really should not be in this field because she just had a scientific mind. So she went on to, um, and inside of a lot of obstacles, actually. She had, she was a physics teacher, and she had a lot of, um, her advisor and others would tell her all the time you should drop physics because girls don't do well in science. Uh, and, and minorities don't do well in math. And so she was constantly encouraged to drop out of her major in physics. Instead, she finished in three years and went on to get her degree. She got a physics degree and then went on to get her master's in physics, in astrophysics. And then went on to get her MD and her PhD in medicine. So apparently minorities do math. Girls are okay in math. Um, so she just clearly was passionate about it. And, and I clearly was not. So I decided not to go to medical school. And I started working at a TV station because uh, at Harvard you could get credit for working and I didn't really chew up the time in class. So I figured this was a good sort of stopgap measure until I could figure out what I wanted to do and I discovered that I loved it. I loved it. So what happened next? So uh, I, you know, I was working as an intern, which means for no money, which my parents who had <laughs> just spent like $100,000 on my education and I hadn't finished yet. And they were like, so you're working for free? and <laughs> How does this end? And when do we get our money back? Uh, and you know, as I'm sure your parents were saying the same thing. Um, and they offered me a job. I started working at that station, and I, I climbed the ranks pretty quickly. Uh, I had been an intern, which involved getting coffee and removing staples. Literally, I got a staple, whatever those things are called, and I would run around the building, no joke, and remove the staple. Um, welcome to the exciting world of TV. Uh, and then I um, was hired to be a production assistant which meant you know, that plus answering phones, and then I became a writer trainee, and a writer, and an associate producer, field producer, line producer, segment producer, and by then, three years after I had been with the station, uh, I got a call from NBC Network to go work at NBC in New York. So what happened with the school process? You know, I, I had really thought that I would go back pretty quickly once I figured out what I wanted to do, and I just never really had the time at that time. So I ended up going back to college when I was 34 and pregnant with my first daughter. And uh, I got my degree. And I was in class with 18 year olds who was really <laughs> <and I'm> pregnant. <laughs> I was kind of crazy. But, um, but I knew that if I, if I didn't finish uh, and I had a child, I would never, I wouldn't be able to go back. I think that would just be too hard. So um, I finished that. Explain why after having such a prestigious job, you know, <clears throat> making some relatively uh, good money, why would you decide to go back at that point? You know, I you didn't need to go back. No, by then I was anchoring uh, the Weekend Today show, and um, so I could really work it out because I could do the show Saturday and Sunday, obviously, it was when the show's on, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, be in school, go, go off to school right after the show on Sunday. You know, so like, one, it could work. Logistically, you could make that happen. And then also, I think I'm a finisher. You know, the idea of not having my degree, um, you know, except for the fact that my husband was running around telling people that he was sleeping with a co-ed. <laughs> um, 
outside of the album, actually. Uh, outside of that, you know, I, he, no one cared. No one cared for me. I really was the only person who cared. And it was because I wanted to finish. I wanted, I didn't want to leave it done. I didn't want to have to correct people when they said, oh, you graduated from Harvard. I said, well, no, you know, I didn't graduate. I wanted to finish. And it didn't really make a difference. And, you know, by then, once I was working, actually, the, um, the, the, you know, the, the business would pay for it. So NBC paid for my degree. Your um, recent documentary, Blair Mountain, that was two weeks ago? Three weeks ago. Yeah, about three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Uh, and it was about? Blair Mountain, it was called uh, Battle for Blair Mountain, and it was a, uh, a look at really the fight over this one mountain, which is called Blair Mountain, which is a historic mountain in um, Logan County, West Virginia. Blair Mountain, back in 1921, was the site of the biggest uh, labor uprising in the history of the United States. Um, back then, people were trying to unionize as coal miners, and they, the coal companies didn't want a union to form. So they, 10,000 miners, basically, were um, fighting against the coal supporters and coal company owners. The coal company owners, who were very tight with the president at the time, called at the president to send in troops. And so the president sent in air support to fire upon the striking uh, workers, coal workers. And it's actually where the term redneck comes from, because the coal miners wore red bandanas around their necks. And so if you were a redneck, you were a coal miner uh, from West Virginia. And so we wanted to tell the story of a new battle at Blair Mountain, which is some people want to make Blair Mountain this historic site about labor. Uh, but the coal companies own it. And of course, they really don't want to, you know, do a testimony to <laughs> uh, labor dispute. They, they actually lost. There was um, unionization, uh, and slowly they've been cutting back on the unions pretty sharply, actually. So today, the battle for Blair Mountain is really between environmentalists who say coal mining is poisoning the water and the air quality, and the people who are coal miners who understand that you know, there are no other $65,000 a year jobs that you can get with a high school degree. That's it. So there are other, there's a Walmart nearby, there's you know, some retail jobs. Um, people talk about green jobs coming into the area, but there are no real green jobs actually coming into the area. So the question began, can, you know, who's right? Is it the coal miners who say, we want jobs, or is it the people who say you're, you know, you're poisoning water? And and actually both are right. I mean, so really, what made it an interesting story was that both sides had a very uh, reasonable point, and yet couldn't come to an agreement or see eye to eye. I mean, the mountains in Logan County, West Virginia, if you've never been there, are flat. They're kind of like um, Arizona, you know. So they have this shape, and then they're locked up. They do uh, mountaintop removal. So they go and they chop the top off the mountain. They get the coal seam. And then they kind of pack it back up, but by doing that, they, they destroy streams. And, you know, streams get landfill, covers up the streams. So um, we got hate mail on all sides. The environmentalists felt that we you know humanized coal miners, and we shouldn't have done that. The coal miners felt that we gave the environmentalists a voice, and they hated that. So we had so much hate mail on all sides um, that um, that I felt like we kind of did our job well. Is that the kind of response you want? Um, for some stories, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I don't think anybody, most of, the, most of the documentaries about coal that I've seen are either really one-sided, you know, why America loves coal, and then they show like small children splashing in the water, and it's ridiculous. And then on the other side, you know, the other, there was something called The Last Mountain, which was about people who go in and basically chain themselves, you know, and, and, and the only problem with that documentary, which is a very pro-environmentalist documentary, is that it didn't actually interview any actual coal miners. You know, and, and as I say, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't know, outside of the people we interviewed, I don't know any coal miners. So I, I do like when I flick a light switch, the <coughs> lights come on, and that's because of coal, because the you know, electricity, 50% of the country is powered by coal. Uh, but I don't have a dog in the fight, and so I thought we would be able to do a straight down the middle look at the actual battle, fairly, because I'm not on one side or the other. The, uh, is it Ernest Withers? Ernest Withers. Ernest Withers who was a photographer for the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if it's alleged, but it's sort of confirmed. confirmed that he was also a CIA operative or informant. Right. Um, what was the response you got from this? Well, we, we did that documentary over in, in Black History Month, and it was uh, a look, at, it was shocking when the word came out. I think it was September before the February where our documentary ran. Which was last, last February. Right. 
uh, Ernest Withers was any iconic civil rights photo you've ever seen, chances are Ernest Withers took it. So, I mean, they're the most breathtaking. Example. Oh gosh, there's a million. Um, anytime you've seen the shots where it says coloreds only or whites only, and you know, I mean, just I, I can't even think of Melinda or um, Emmett Till in the casket, or I mean, just everyone. Dr. There. King. Right, Dr. King uh, lying on his bed reading the newspaper um, at the Lorraine Motel, et cetera. So he had a lot of access. So all those types of photos, he took those photos. So to have someone allege that he was an informant for the FBI, which they were able to do because when some of the um, FBI document, documents were released, they had redacted fully. That same thing actually that just happened with the WikiLeaks, right? They didn't redact some of the names so we could go back and trace and attach people to case numbers and then figure out who was the informant. Um, so, um, so it became clear that he was an informant. And you know, I, I say alleged only because he died and so he was never tried, he's never been I think his family has certainly come to terms with the fact that most likely he was. Uh, it was interesting to talk to the people in the civil rights movement, like Andrew Young, who was like, listen, if he was, good for him. I hope he made some money out of it. That surprised me. Um, you know, it was exactly not what I thought he was going to say. Uh, others would say, you know, he's a dirty dog if he was selling out his own people. But, um, Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Um, you know, which was very interesting to even understand the difference between the activists in Chicago versus the activists in Memphis versus the activists in Atlanta, you know, just to get inside the civil rights movement and realize it wasn't, people were not on the same page. Um, when you talk to Andrew Young, activist in Atlanta, about Memphis, which is where Dr. King was shot, and you say, so tell me about that day. He's like, I told him not to go to Memphis. Don't waste your time, <laughs> you know. Uh, you talk to um, the people who are the activists in Memphis who needed Dr. King to come to help with sanitation workers story. I mean, it was just very interesting to learn sort of the nuance inside the movement. And so, you know, the same thing happened in this Ernest Gaines interview. People had a very different take on it. Um, there's some people who never believe that he was an informant. It seems pretty clear from the documents that he was an informant. The family members really don't dispute it. Um, I think that they realized as soon as it became a bigger issue that it actually made the museum. It literally was announced that he was an informant the day before his museum was about to open. And of course, they felt like the legacy of their father was being trampled upon. And then I think like the PR power of that, they're like, oh, or <laughs> more people will come to our museum if they, you know, but that. So they were great to work with. And I think they, um, what they really wanted, you know, the question we wanted to answer was, if you are an informant, how does that change the value of these photos that you took? I mean, one of the reasons that um, Emmett Till really became such an important moment in the civil rights movement was because of Ernest Withers. He took the photos, he created his own book, self-published. Um, you know, he made sure that these are the pictures that got out to the mainstream white media. You know, so he was the person who would give those photos to the New York Times. Um, you know, he was really important for the movement. So it kind of brought up a lot of complicated questions about, well, what if he was undermining? And was he even actually undermining the movement at the same time? Um, and how does that affect the art? Does that impact the value of someone's artistic ability? He was an amazing. There's a great shot where you see three black attorneys from the NAACP arguing with three white attorneys, and it's over um, access to facilities in Memphis. And you're looking at this picture, and he's in the back of the judge's head, and you're like, well, shit, where was he standing to get this picture? I mean, if you're, if you're seeing the black attorneys, and the white attorneys and the back, he's standing right behind the judge's head. Like, who gets that kind of access? I mean, it really spoke, you know, photos like that, when you figure out what his perspective was, really spoke to, um, you know, kind of the, the opportunity and access that he had. Other people couldn't get that shot. Or there's a great picture of a man, an amazing black man, wheeling a stroller that says something like, you know, we just want dignity. And cops in a patrol car, you know, jeering at him at the window. The little girl in the picture has now grown up to be a doctor who lives in Memphis. And you know, it was just it, so much meaning in a photo. Um, he was really a master, so does his, uh, do the allegations undermine the quality of the art? What sort of question that we wanted to, to tackle? How many pages is your last book? A lot. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 300? 400 pages, something like that. Something like that. Um, <laughs> I could that? change the margins, because I used to do a lot in college and make it more. <laughs> who 
would you like to read your book? You know, I think that, um, honestly, I didn't write the book for other people. I wrote it for me. I never, in fact, I do documentaries the same way. I really don't do it for other people. I try to reflect accurately and honestly what I'm seeing. And people, would, even when we did Black America or Latino, I mean, and say, oh, you're, this is really for white people who want to learn about black people. Oh, this is for Latinos who want to see themselves. It's like, actually, it's just the way I see it. And I hope everybody watches. And so the same thing with the book. I think it's I think it's an accurate portrayal of what it was like to grow up at a time and a place where I grew up. And I think to cover some of the stories that I've covered that have in many cases to do about race and what the value of being biracial in this day and age is as we have a black president and kind of what the conversations are around race and opportunity for someone who's also first generation American. I think there's a whole group of people who can find value in that story, and maybe not the usual suspect that you might think. I think a lot of women um, see themselves in that, but I've been amazed at them. I think it's just the story of America. Can I get a show of hands up? I want to ask, <coughs> how do people receive the news now? So how many of you guys get the news from television? Show of hands. Wow, that's scary me, okay. How many of you get uh, your news from a newspaper? Um, sometimes. How many get your news from uh, Facebook? Facebook. Who gets from Twitter? How do you get news from Twitter? <laughs> do people just send you stuff? I follow. Oh, I see. So you follow a news organization. Yeah. Interesting. All right, follow me. See you But mostly <laughs> from television. Online. Oh. Online. Yeah. Online. TV. Online. No, Who do you follow online? That one. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have to just say it because you're saying it. Or you can tell you Some box watchers up here. <laughs> All good. Um, we talk a lot about leading news stories. I enjoy the conversations we have a lot about it. So, talking to a young audience of brilliant people, you're going to be leaders one day, what is the, how should they get their news? Or, which, what questions should they be asking themselves or other people about the news? I guess, you know, I think a lot of people get their news off of Facebook. They sort of follow their friends' links, which I do, right? Someone sends me a link, and I'm like, oh, I read this, great, you know. But my problem with that is that it doesn't really expand your understanding of what's happening in the world. I mean, you definitely get, like, the wacky stories. Um, Give me an example. Today's example. There's a man who threw his seven-year-old son over the cruise ship because the kid wouldn't stop crying. So he threw him overboard. That's amazing, I'm sorry. But that has zero like value to the world. Um, just interesting. That's the water cooler story. Um, but it's not really going to affect if your roads ever get paved here in New Orleans. It's not really going to affect uh, abortion rights. It's not really going to affect who's going to be the president in 2012. That's just a really, like, wow, damn story. Um, so to me, I read the paper. I read, you know, follow everything online, obviously. I watch a lot of TV because I think that transcripts don't necessarily cut it. And you can now watch clips online, but I, I don't do that quite as often. I tend to watch you know, shows live. Um, I guess I just really like information. And I think once you get all the information, you can really make up your own mind. And my concern is that when people sort of pick and choose the stream that exactly reflects what they already believe, you never really grow. I mean, I, 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 I'm a big supporter of watching everybody. I watch everybody. Absolutely. One, I want to see what they're doing. I want to see if they're doing it better than we're doing it. And, and, and what I like about it, what I don't like about it. But also, I want to know what stories they, they, they're they covering and how they're telling that story. You know, what, what do they leave in? What do they leave out? You know, so what do you recommend? Well, um, I read the Financial Times. It's so boring, but it's really worth it. Um, to slog through it because it gives a great international perspective on America. Um, there's a great magazine that Keith Reinhardt, a friend of mine, ours, gave me, which is called The Week, which gives you a summary of all the important stories of all the magazines. It's great. They're sort of like, they just chunk it for you. Um, in New York, The Post, The Daily News, which is basically just crap, but you know, good gossipy stuff. Uh, I go to CNN.com, um, and then I watch all the morning shows, and I try to watch all the TV shows. Okay, you're a student, you got 
for relations class and a bunch of other stuff to do on the job. Oh really? Everybody's busier than me? With <laughs> <laughs> like, my four kids? Really? Huh. <laughs> Is that right? So you get up and take your kids to school, right? Get them dressed, make sure they've eaten something. Oh, go back, get the homework they left behind, bring them back to school, go to the office. Yeah? That no, would until the work. Right. I know. They won't appreciate that until they're 30 and they're like, wow, I really didn't have that much to do when I was in college. Um, you know, I, I, I think that if you're getting stuff online, then just go to the major organizations. So you want to see people who disagree, so you can figure out what the real story is. One thing I like about working at CNN is that I, I think we hit the news right down the middle. And maybe sometimes what we don't do well is we don't make it riveting. We can be boring. But I think we've tried not to editorialize um, the position. And I know that some people think, well, Fox is conservative and CNN is liberal. And I actually don't think that's the case. We certainly never get. Um, you know, again, I got as much hate mail from environmentalists who I think would describe themselves as very liberal as I did the conservative coal miners who, you know, they only did our dog, uh, but it did well. Um, so, you know, I, I think that you just have to go to sources that are going to be good sources. And then also read the crazy stuff. You know, I love, there's some website, I don't know how I got subscribed to this, this daily, but it's like crazy Obama haters. I mean, crazy people. And you know, I read their um, their little note every single day. I'm really interested in what their perspective is. I don't agree with it at all. I think they're really nasty, and they're constantly calling for like certain states to secede from the union and things like that. I mean, but it's interesting to know. And I think if you can do that all online. I think you can do it relatively quickly. Uh, we've done the word association now. Oh gosh. So you know, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm gonna throw them out there, and you tell me what you think. Okay. Do a little different with you this time. <laughs> words. Okay. The most important stories topping the news right now that we should be concerned about. So now you have Jeff, but he just forgot. Um, uh, Libya. Um, very annoyed about the was the hurricane overblown story. Complete bullshit. Um, and one in five children in this country is in poverty. One in five. That's a crazy number. You know, wealthiest nation is really poor. And what are the most unimportant stories that are receiving way too much attention? Well, I love Kim Kardashian's way down. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, actually, those things really depress me because I sort of feel like, and I'm sure she didn't spend $40 million on her wedding, but I feel like, God, if you would just give half of that to somebody. You could send such a great message, right? Imagine if you said, you know what, our wedding bill is $40 million, and so what we're gonna do is give 20 of it to fill in the blank charity, to send a message to Americans that you could have a great wedding, and also blah, 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 there's one in five kids are in poverty. And so while we're eating our wedding cake, we wanna be remind everyone that others are not eating tonight, and we're going to take a step in that, I don't know. You know, and I feel like that would be a great PR win, right? It would just be, or when Paris Hilton, you know, she's sort of out of favor now, but you know, same thing, she was girl is followed by like 20 cameras at all times. Wouldn't it be amazing if she said, well, actually, you know, there's starvation in Africa. I could go and, and shine a light on that, and all the cameras would go with her. It just sometimes feels like people don't really leverage their celebrity uh, for all the right things. I mean, just occasionally. Okay, so Kim Kardashian's wedding. That's this one. Um, you know, man throwing kid overboard, it's probably another one. Uh, oh gosh, Casey Anthony, geez, let's let that one go. Um, <laughs> how many do I need? Three? Oh, that's good enough. Okay. What's your favorite word? My favorite word is actually. You know why? It's like a, you can end to turn something around, right? Someone's like lying to you and telling you. You say, actually, sir, it didn't happen that way at all. Least favorite word? <laughs> Honestly. People always say honestly right before they lie to you. Always. <laughs> oh, honest, and then they lie. <laughs> <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? I think young people who are really passionate and interested in something make me want to follow around and support them. When I see people who worked very hard, I mean, the girls that we support in our foundation, you see how hard they worked. You know, they, they're ability and what they've been able to achieve and how passionate they are for their own success kind of gets me engaged in that. What turns you off? 
for people who have high expectations about what they deserve. You know, I've had a number of TV news, we have a lot of interns come through, and we have a lot of people who sort of feel like, you know, listen, I don't get coffee. I'm not gonna come in before nine. I'm like, not a problem. I don't write recommendations. <laughs> um, you know, we can, we can play this game. We'll have to look out. Uh, you know, I just think that, that there, that there are, and probably this way it's always been, I'm sure my parents said about our generation when we were coming into the workforce, oh, they just think they deserve so much. But I've had many young people tell me, you know, I really don't want to start as a PA. I really want to start as an editor. I'm like, and go with God, find that job, good, you know. But that happens a lot. Um, and those, you know, those people tend to fall by the wayside. What is your favorite coach for? Wait, wait, that's a good question. Wait, fuck. <laughs> What sound or noise do you love? Um, you know, the sound I love is when my kids laugh. My kids are now old enough that they are just hilarious, and they just laugh in great ways that just make you laugh. What sound or noise do you hate? other than your own would you like to attempt? You know, I always wanted to do hair. I thought I'd be great with a flat iron. <laughs> what? Oh, don't ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up a black girl in all white Long Island. I spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to <laughs> What profession would you like not to do? Almost everything else. I think banking would be boring. I think, um, being a trumpet player seems like a lot of work. <laughs> I think my job seems kind of easy compared to that. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? We've been expecting you. I think that's very beautiful here. Okay, so now you guys have an opportunity to ask Ms. O'Brien what you like, what you want. So just raise your hand and she'll point you out. What was it like growing up with five siblings? I loved it. I love it. I have four kids now, and I wish I had more. Um, because I love being part of a big family. I actually think, um, you know, we had two kids first, and I remember saying I really wanted to have a third, because I felt like a family was so small. didn't feel like a family, it felt so small, and then a set of twins. Um, but I would love to have had, if I don't live in New York City, I have six kids. Um, I loved having, uh, you know, especially since I lived in a town where we weren't really that well liked and we didn't blend in very well. And so um, I think to have siblings who are all your same age and who very much, you know, stuck up for you. I always had playmates around and I didn't have to, you know, worry about being friendless <coughs> in the classroom, in the hallways. You know, I always had people around me pretty close by. So I really, really, really liked it. And now I think because we're all very close in age, we're, we're pretty tight. That's been very helpful. Next question. Yeah. Um, how do you keep from getting, um, like in the Blair um, subject, too, as a journalist, too emotionally involved? Like, how did you not take one side and then just go straight down the middle? A, you know, I, I think that that's a good question. And I think the answer is first of all, you work with a team, right? So you're yeah. constantly at the end of your shoot sitting down and like hashing through. So someone will say, well, I think, you know, I think this person is clearly right. And then you go interview someone and like, no, wait a minute, that person's clearly right. And so then you're constantly having these sort of editorial sessions where you're, I think you're, we keep each other on track. And we also make sure that everything somebody says, we then go and search for the actual confirmation of it. That, for example, um, at one point I was walking down, you know, past this river with one of the coal miners' wives. And she said, the water here is great. I said, are you kidding <laughs> The water literally runs out brown and smells. It's disgusting. I mean, it's disgusting. She said, I would drink that. I'm like, no, you wouldn't drink You would not drink that. That is a lie. And you, I wouldn't let you drink that. That's disgusting. You know, you had to constantly sort of check them because everybody's, you know, and the same on the other side. Um, and so then we go and make sure that we test the water, have an independent company test the water and see what actually is in it. And then when we sat down, <laughs> we sat down with the coal miners and their wives, and I'd say, so, you know, it's five times the amount of dissolved ions that you should have. They said, well, you know, I mean, if a deer came and drank and keeled over, then I'd worry. They're like, no, seriously, <laughs> really? Um, you know, so part of the value in that conversation was when we present them with the facts. 
about an independent test that we have done on their water. You know, they don't really want to see it. Um, you know, so I feel like it's my job to just represent accurately how that conversation went and you know, push back in certain ways. But I really, I liked the coal miners a ton. And I like the environmentalists a ton. And both of them lie like rugs when it comes to their own thing. They just do. But I like them personally. They're really nice people. And I always like the people I work with. But you know, that's not get confused about how this you know, affects the story. Next question. Another question. Uh, two part question. First part being do the PAs that you usually work with, uh, or interns in general, are they mostly students or are they just? You know, fresh coming out of school. Interns are okay. So you might want to move back to chairs, not schools. <laughs> no, no. It's good. Uh, the interns are always students. Okay. You have to be enrolled in school to be an intern because what you get is it used to be you just get credit, and now we have to pay our interns, which has actually been a little bit of a problem. It's good because for interns you make some money. It's bad because once you're being paid ten dollars an hour. We no longer spend the day letting the interns just shadow us and follow us around. And you know, we sit there and say, "Okay, log more tape." And I'm paying you ten dollars an hour. I need you to accomplish this today. And I always thought that a value of an internship was to be able to some days just do nothing. You know, come and hang out, see what we do, see what we do in the field, travel on a story, um, do interesting things, maybe shoot something. Now that everybody's getting paid, there's this real sense of well, something has to be accomplished because um, you're getting paid. Well, only students can be interns. Uh, PAs are people, it's the first job that you can get an entry level job. Okay. Although at CNN we have something called VJs for video journalists. It's a similar thing, they mostly in Atlanta. And, um, and those are the entry level, right out of school kinds of jobs. And you know, the great thing about CNN is we have a lot of uh, bureaus, a lot of people are shutting their bureaus, we have board opening bureaus. Um, and so we have a lot of um, opportunities, we have a ton of young people coming through. We hire interns all the time and production assistants. And the second part of the uh, question would be, you know, with the younger-minded people, do you tend to pick their brains? Uh, Constantly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that if you really, you know, the value of diversity, and I think often when people talk about diversity, they're really saying, like, sometimes it's a euphemism for black people or it's Latinos. It, you know, to me, diversity is just very different people saying, well, you know, one way to come at it is like this. For example, whenever I do sports stories, which is very rare, I know nothing about sports. Literally, my husband has to spend an hour on the phone with me. Roger Clemens, <laughs> you know, this is what he does. <laughs> You're the kind of question, oh my God, don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> I, I, like, I know nothing about sports. And you know, so you want to sit down with people who are really obsessed with sports, so that not only are you asking the obvious question, you're asking the great question. You're like, what's the really brilliant, what's the great question I should ask? So you want somebody who's crazy about sports, and you want somebody else who's, you know, for, so for me, diversity is a whole range. We want young people who are gonna contribute in some capacity. Now, I think there is a sense, um, some people come and expect that, you know, their word has as much weight as my word, and that, that's just not the case. We work in a hierarchical system, and I'm at the top of the hierarchy. Um, so, you know, usually what I say ultimately goes, but usually my, my ideas are formulated by listening to a lot of other people's ideas, and sometimes out now stealing their ideas so that we can make a good product. Um, but yeah, I think anybody who who doesn't well listen to everybody's voice, you're just setting yourself up for some major failure. Next question. Yeah. How did you choose just one thing to uh, devote charity to? That was really hard. You know, we picked, um, we created our foundation right after Hurricane Katrina, and my best friend, who's from New Orleans, um, said to me that there was a girl here who needed a scholarship that she was going to eighth grade. And then if we were gonna give her a scholarship, we had to give her a scholarship through high school. And, um, but she had gone to a free Catholic middle school and they found her a place at Ursuline Academy, but that she couldn't afford it. And so because she asked, we agreed to do it. But we really pretty quickly realized that there were a lot of girls like this young woman who were in need. And we just kind of kept picking people up after we did Black in America and met a young woman who, um, her name's Naya. And we were doing a story on her. She was getting an HIV test. And beautiful girl, very sharp. And I'm like, why are you, why are you here getting an HIV test? And she said, well, you know, I have a boyfriend, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, why are you not in school? So I have a kid. I can't afford daycare. So after the documentary aired, we said, well, you know, we'll make you our second scholarship recipient. We will pay for your daycare if you go to college. And she applied, and now she's a junior. 
Um, and you know, we just kept finding people who were just really, just really smart and really hardworking and kind of had overcome pretty incredible odds to get to where they were, and yet they didn't have any kind of cushion. Like in my family, when Harvard would raise its tuition, my parents would sit around and you know complain, but then they'd write the check. You know, and for these kids, three hundred dollars meant you were going to drop out. Um, you know, and it just seemed really unfair. Uh, and I think that's the case. I think college is ridiculously expensive today, and I think that a lot of that is you know goes to facilities and not necessarily to, to teachers. I mean, I'm not sure where all those expenses are going, but it's, it's insanely expensive. And so most students start life out of college in massive debt. So if you have a situation like uh, Erica, one of our young women, who you know went to school, kept taking out loans, and then would work, take you know, drop out, work, try to pay back some of the loan, but she got so in debt that by the time she was a junior, you know she knew I'm going to drop out, I'm not going to graduate, I'm going to be sixty thousand dollars in debt, and not have accomplished what I was you know set out to accomplish. It just seemed really unfair. So we ended up, we had six girls. We started a seventh this year. We had one young woman who graduated from UNO um, this past year. And, uh, and then her dad enrolled as a freshman. And what we saw was that the impact was tremendous. First of all, people just, I was stunned at how their grades improved. Once you, that made sense, right? Once you didn't have to juggle work and all the other things and you had a scholarship, you just had more time to focus on your work. Um, but that, they really had a tremendous impact on their community, on their kids. Naya, who we paid for her daycare and then started picking up her college costs. Uh, her son is you know, starting a kindergarten now uh, in the Gifted and Talented program. You know, a lot of that's because he went to a really good daycare, you know, great quality daycare. And his mom really wanted him to succeed. And he, you know, when his mom would come home, she'd study. And so he'd come home to a mom who was sitting down, you know, cracking the books. Um, he understood the value of that. So we've seen sort of the impact the student certainly impact the community, impact the parents who then realize you know, all that I think builds stability into that individual so that you can have your degree and you can earn more money. And the goal is to get people out of poverty. And the only way to really do that is education. Next question. Um, what's? <laughs> yes. um, you said when you were younger, your sister was one of the main reasons you went to Harvard and you were looking up to her and stuff. And then from there you went to intern, and that's how you got into it. Were there any other influences in going into media, or did you just go into it and you're like, I love it? I, I literally that. went into it because I had no idea what else to do. I, I just knew I wasn't going to go to medical school. And so that was you know, something that I, I was an English major, so I knew I could write, I could get an internship, and you could get credit and still sort of be enrolled in school without actually doing coursework. Um, and I got there. Is that me? Sorry. Um, and I got there, and I loved it. I literally knew the first day when I was in a newsroom, and this was a newsroom, we used to have these big, giant, what they call three-quarter inch tapes, and you'd have to run to back to what they call the ENG, electronic news gathering, and throw these tapes, shove them in a machine, and they'd have to queue up. It would always take about six seconds, it was the longest six seconds of your life, because you're always late. And women would take their shoes off to run down the hall, because it was that close. Like, you, you might miss air if you couldn't get down to ENG fast enough. That was amazing. It was just to be part of a team covering breaking news or covering anything. Um, you know, what's his name? Pat, Pat Bergeron? Pat Ber Tom Bergeron? He does like Hollywood Squares. I used to get his coffee. He was a local talent in Boston, and my job was to run him scripts, and he used to yell at all the time and fetch his coffee. I mean, I just loved being part of this team. It was very exciting, and it was really interesting. And then I saw people who I didn't think were really that good. I mean, I remember some of the anchors in that station at the time the Soviet Union was falling. They were terrible, they didn't have a clue what that what meant. You know, we didn't have Google back then, right? So no one was gonna like spell it out for you. You're gonna have to read about it and research <laughs> back in the day. You know, and you, and, and so, you know, the questions that she would ask were so stupid. I was like, I just, my, my stupid questions are just as bad as these questions. Like, I could be doing that job. And I really thought like, I, you know, clearly, that's a job I could do because she's not read in at all. And she's, you know, interviewing people. And so I sort of, saw that there was opportunities, and then, and then on top of that, you just worked harder than people. I mean, what if you actually read in, took a book home, and read about the Soviet Union so that you did 10 really smart questions because you read a book about it that no one else had done? You know, maybe you could, or you call up someone at a college and ask them, you know, so give me some sense of the impact and implications 
of the Soviet Union collapsing, and you went into your interview, you know, really well prepared. Suddenly, you just get way ahead of people just by working a little bit harder. I don't like that. Next question. How often do you win? How often do we win? Do, do you win? You just oh, do we run win? It? Um, you know, really not that much anymore. You, you, you win it, you're always sort of, for example, this hurricane in New York, right? You're out there, you don't really know what's going to happen. We went out to the uh, far west side and the Hudson River was overtopping its banks, which I know for you guys means nothing. But for people in New York City, the Hudson River never overtops its banks, ever. And so it's the water started to flood across the west side highway. That's a big deal. So the report that I did was, oh my gosh, we're standing in two feet of water as the Hudson River has overtopped its banks. Keep in mind, the east side reporter has just done his report. The East River is also overtopping its banks. People are freaking out and they've evacuated you know, parts of New York, which are all landfill. But around that report is, so where we're standing is, the reason it's overtopping the banks is this is all landfill. In fact, the dirt that I'm standing on was placed here when they dug out the World Trade Center. They took that dirt, so much of it, and built you know, buildings on top of it, right here. And so this is why it's flooding. Now, here are the implications of what that means. And this is flood area A, and this, so, so it's the winging it, the breaking news, here's what's happening at the moment that I'm here, but also wrapped in a package of, and here's why it matters, and here's the context of it, and here's what the issues are, and here's what we were expecting and didn't see, and here's what we weren't expecting and we are seeing. So you really rarely just wing it, which is why you kind of have to be prepared you want to wing part of it, but connect it to something. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, that's why those stories, like a guy chucking his kid over the side of the cruise ship, really interesting, but it doesn't really have meaning in any way. I mean, how's that to the kid and probably to the court system, where I'm sure this man is in cuffs somewhere. Next question. Yeah. Do you have a routine to prepare yourself for these uh, interviews and these documents? I do. I read everything, and then I have to write. The way I learn is I have to write everything down. I'm a learner by writing, so I can't remember anything unless I've written it down. And then I write down 100 questions, and then I cut those 100 questions into 40 questions. And then I take those 40 questions and categorize them. Like, interviews have to have a beginning and a middle and an end. You can't just chuck questions at people. So you want them to sort of tell a story. And then you always take your first question and you throw it out, especially if you're doing a live interview, because the first question is usually an easy question, sort of a, so why did you decide to write the book? Or so what, you know, and, and if you only have four minutes, you don't want to start with that. You want to start with something that's, you know, so where's the money, uh, that kind of thing. And so I found that by ditching my first question, always made my interview kind of start aggressively, sort of in the middle, bring everybody up to speed and then just get right into it. And that helped a lot. So for live interviews, all interviews, but really important for live interviews is to have an actual arc, a beginning, a middle, and an end of your interview. Is that What's been the biggest struggle in your career? I think it's the logistics of having four kids and trying to be a good mom. And uh, as my kids get older, they need support like in homework and things like that. And the way that people learn math today is completely different than how I learn math. Um, so sometimes I have to sit down and kind of learn how she learned it so that I can go back and help her with the problems she's having. Um, or even some things like I never really was all that great at geometry and now I'm like, <laughs> pulling out the protractor trying to figure out angles. Um, you know, so I think it's just the logistics, because I travel a lot. I'm on the road all the time, and that's important for my job. You know, Anderson probably travels more than any of us, but that's the job. You know, you have to go where the news is, and especially if you do docs, but even if you do breaking news, you have to travel. And, and then I, for the foundation work that I do and some of the other boards that I sit on, I have to go meet people. I, I, I have to very much see people face to face to understand their story. So it's why I like what I do. But with four kids, all of whom are now, my, my lists are in first grade, my twins, and then I have a fifth grader and a fourth grader. You know, that's hard. It's just a struggle. Um, and sometimes I feel like they suffer because I'm not there to help them remember homework. They suffer because I'm not there to, you know, I have sitters, but the sitters you know, often English is not the first language, or they just don't necessarily know how to do math either, or you know, it's just hard for them, and I'm their mom, and that's, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So that's been the biggest challenge, I like, think, kind of making it all work. Last question. Yeah. What was the uh, tsunami in Japan? Huh. Tsunami in Japan was crazy. First of all, 
nobody really understood. It wasn't the tsunami part, right? Tsunamis roll in, they roll out. And even though you'd be standing on the street and they had these mini tsunamis all the time, so all of a sudden you look down, you'd be in a foot of water, you're standing in water, they just kind of creep up. But what was really crazy was sort of the nuclear disaster part of it because the entire team flew out and Anderson and I were sitting next to each other for part of the flight. And I'm like, so what do you think's going on? Like, what do you think is happening with this nuclear disaster? I mean, are we, you know, going into this thing? And no one really knew. And that was a little bit crazy because we kept getting sent places and we didn't really, we had 12 teams in, in country and, um, and eventually we pulled out all the three because they wanted to be able to pull us out and they set your Blackberry so that you have a homing device so that if something happens, they can, as they call us, they can recover your body later for your family. Um, but you never know. Right, I was like, you might want to change that. How about find you to rescue you in a chopper? Uh, but you just never really, you know, we would get these Blackberry messages. Um, make sure iodine pills are now mandatory. Make sure you go to the fifth floor of the Westin Hotel to take your iodine pills. And I'd be like, so yeah, Anderson, you get the iodine pills? He's like, we left that hotel three hours ago. We didn't get any help. And so you're constantly trying to figure out really what kind of danger am I in? What kind of risk am I in? You're always got, you know, you have to be in some risk. Um, because that's why you're there. You're there to kind of get in as close as you can. But also, it's just very unusual to have a sort of a disease. You know, and then the Japanese, of course, government was terrible. They just lied outright. So they get these messages. It looks like reactor three is no longer has any problems. And you'd be like, except for that plume of smoke that's like wafting up from reactor three. Except for that, it seems fine. Um, you know, so like the government, when then they come back and like, well, we were wrong when we said it didn't have a problem. Now we're, now we're saying for sure it doesn't have a problem. So it just was constant chaos and, and, and lying on all fronts. Um, and that was very strange. And then on top of it, at one point, we had a lot of tsunami warnings for, for the next round of tsunamis coming through. And what I found very hard about that was you know, planes would come in and say, tsunami, tsunami, three meter tsunami, everybody get out to higher ground. But they were often false alarms because of the aftershocks, right? So the aftershock would trigger another tsunami. And we knew if we didn't really feel an aftershock, you probably wouldn't get hit by a tsunami. But sometimes you feel the aftershock and then you didn't know. And I had probably 10 people with me and we had all our gear and we'd be cabled down 500 yards. And you're kind of like, so I can make everybody stay because if I stay, everybody stays. Right? And if a tsunami runs in, it's going to kill everybody and it's going to be my fault. Because they won't leave the bottom of people. And if I start to run, everybody will start to run. And it was just really, you know, people like baby, you know, just felt, I, I hated being in that position. I didn't really want to be the one who made everybody stay. Uh, and then plus you had all this gear, and then the guys who run the satellite trucks, we have something called a flyaway, which is a satellite truck, a satellite dish that's in 16 pieces, it's like boxes, and you can put it together and you put it on the back of the truck and then you can <coughs> broadcast high quality satellite pictures. Those guys are stuck, right? They're, they can't dismantle the truck every time there's a warning. You know, so we would we'd get a warning and every time after we decide we'd all run, we'd climb up to somebody's roof and sit on the roof and then, you know, just it just was crazy, crazy. And um, that was probably the most unpleasant, I think, because you just never really knew what was going on, unlike stories where you're really covering the aftermath. A tsunami has rolled through, we're here to tell this story and this story and this story. And then culturally, the Japanese are very different. So people would do interviews and they would laugh. And I would talk to the interpreter and he'd say, oh yes, he lost his, both his parents. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, are you sure? Because he's laughing, but, but it, you know, the, the culture is not one to question authority. And the culture was, it was very strange. So there's so many interviews you couldn't use because it seemed as if people were sort of giggling and it was just nervousness. Um, but you just couldn't put that on television because it's, it's just so uh, discordant with the interview that you're doing. So that was probably one of the hardest stories I had to do.